All right, thanks, Dan. Um, for those that are having lunch, yeah, feel free to feel feel free to join. Um, it's, it seems strange. I think we're mostly doing this for online, but this could be an open discussion. So feel free to to interrupt me. As Dan said, so I'm a, a faculty at the University of Washington. I'm both in um, I'm a my faculty position is in the Information School, and I have a affiliate position in the Computer Science Department at the University of Washington. And one thing that I've realized in teaching classes in machine learning and and um, data science in general is that our students are really, really good at the mechanics of what we teach them. So if we teach them how to replicate uh, you know, a random forest algorithm, they can do that sort of thing really well. But, uh, but the, the data reasoning side is where they've sort of struggled. And also we live in this world where you know, now fake news is a, is a term that's thrown around in the, in the media all the time. So um, my colleague and I, who I want to recognize, Carl Bergstrom, who's a faculty at the University of Washington as well, we decided to create a course on how to teach students how to formally sort of maybe call BS. Um, so, you know, I think it all starts because we all know that our information environments are insincere and unreliable. Um, and so that's not new. And actually, there's a lot of philosopher. I mean, the most famous philosopher to write a book on this was um, Harry Frankfurt. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is a particular kind of bullshit. Um, there's kind of two kinds of bullshit that I sort of, th I, I break this sort of world of bullshit into. There's the old school bullshit, and that's the kind I see in Seattle, and I'm sure you see it in Silicon Valley a lot. Here's one of the things that, here's one of the statements that we pulled from one of the um, uh, uh, talks. So our collective mission is to refunctionalize customer-driven solutions for leveraging underutilized portfolio opportunities. I mean, we know there's something in there, but I still don't fully know what that means. But the kind of BS that I'm talking about is the world in which I live. I, I know this world pretty well because we teach classes in this and, and we see this all over. Now it's this sort of littering with, um, you know, statistical significance after Bonferroni corrections, our results underscore clinically important effect size. This kind of stuff can also be a kind of bullshit that, um, that really can be just as effective and actually more effective, um, in fact, than even the sort of rhetoric and language that we use all the time. So we've been speaking, thinking a lot about definitions. We've been pulling from definitions from the philosophers, pulling definitions from now psychologists are thinking a lot about this, you know, in terms of the so, sort of, so, uh, you know, and the sociologists, the sort of social epistemology behind this. But really, we see that it involves language and rhetoric, but it also involves statistical figures, data graphics, other forms of presentation intended to impress, overwhelm, and persuade. That's kind of the key definition aspect for us, the key part of the definition. Is, is this aspect of, you know, impressing and overwhelming. Because as Harry Frankfurt said, and as we agree, liars actually know the truth. They're just trying to pull you away from the truth, whereas bullshitters kind of don't really care. They're just trying to impress and persuade. Um, and, and, you know, this, this particular definition is evolving. But I want to talk about it, this, this particular kind of bu bullshit, and that's the kind that's littered in numbers. And the thing about numbers is they sort of <coughs> convey a sense of precision, objectivity. They... they they sort of seem to come like straight from nature. They carry some weight. So let me let me just start. Well, and that's why 30% of like lunch talks are include sort of made up statistics. Um, but there was a uh, there's there's a there was a paper that just came out. Um, well, the 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 news article on the paper came out in the Washington Post a few days ago, talking about a study that showed. You know, I haven't read the study in detail, but it did show the the, the sort of take home message from the study is that charts. And data can change hearts and minds on myths and other kind, other form, uh, or just can change hearts more than just the language itself. And so there's more, more studies going on. I don't think we even need the studies. We sort of know that data can be convincing. But they are sort of like, uh, as my colleague Carl and I talk about, you know, words are, we know their social co the context around them. We know they sort of have this fuzziness about them, whereas numbers seem to come directly from nature. They're, they carry this sort of weight. And this was a statement pulled um, from the Hill. You think the countries are giving us their best people? No, they give us their worst people. So this is that fuzziness that I'm talking about. Whereas if you put a, a number like Breitbart, you know, 2,139 DACA recipients convicted or confused of crime, that's a big number. It carries weight. It's scary. It's a real number. But the thing we tell our students all the time is that they should carry some context and they should have, they should allow us to make comparisons. So if you actually look at that, if, uh, you know, I've looked at the number here that it's actually of DACA recipients. We have one third of one percent of DACA recipients of convicted of crime versus 8.6 Americans that are convicted at least with a felony. 
So it's, that's how we sort of want to teach our students to compare. And that's what I, what I mean by the weight of numbers and the importance of looking at context. And all, all you know, percentages are, are manipulated all the time. You can make percentages look big by, by doing per annums. And to make no, small numbers look big, you can present them in absolute numbers without any context like I just did. Um, you know, this Bitcoin drop in, 2000, in um, December 16th of last year, you know, there were multiple ways in the news that it was reported. Some reported as, you know, it lost 34% of its value in 13 days. Others reported it as overpriced by 52%. So it, it's not that necessarily any of those are wrong, but what they, but, but what this sort of, I tell students, what this conveys is how hard it is, even when you're trying to be honest about numbers, it's hard to convey what they are. So this is what led to the class. I mean, we were discouraged with how we're teaching uh, STEM classes, especially our engineers, on how to question numbers. And so we developed this class, you know, Calling Bullshit was sort of a, a title that sort of was catchy, but it was really about the data reasoning aspect and also, of course, misinformation and fake news, which I'll get to in, in just a bit. So I run a lab at, at the University of Washington where we sort of collide uh, sort of technology, uh, sort of data science methods, machine learning methods uh, on social science questions. Um, and in that time, I found, like I said, students do this really well. They can, they're like better than I can do in terms of the mechanics but it's when I ask them questions like the kind of questions we learn in our humanities classes, they struggle. They struggle a lot more. So that's where we have this class. You can go to the URL, um, callingbullshit.org. You can, we put new material up all the time. There's case studies. There's reading material. Um, we actually have a non-swear word version, too, for the high schools out there. We have callingbull.org, where I have a script that goes and, s and strips all the swear words. Switch you. Yeah, is that not working? Yeah, give you that. Put that in your pocket. Okay. And clip this. <laughs> other pocket? Okay. That's fine. Should I get rid of the other one? No, no, no. Leave the other one. Okay. Pocket. Wow. Okay. You, you get two microphones because you're so important. <laughs> okay. I'll take that. Oh, I don't need that. No, uh, you don't need this one anymore. I don't need that one. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you can go to the website. Check it out if you want. Give us If you have any ideas of uh, bullshit examples in your regular day world, world life, please share it. Um, it did kind of go viral. It's been, it's gone, uh, it's been reported all over the world. Um, but the cool part has been that we now have over 70 universities in one year have started to adopt the content or have contacted us about adopting the course or parts of the course. So there's like a bullshit movement going on in academia, which is good. Um, but the core philosophy on our class is that most of the world, most of the public, they'll have no idea about the black box. They won't know about the algorithm. They won't know how to run a particular statistic. But we claim, our argument, is that you can still teach people how to call BS on data BS by teaching them about the, the, the data input, the data generating process, and also focusing their attention on the interpretation of data. And there's lots of examples like this. Many of you know about this particular paper. There's lots and lots of these papers coming out of the machine learning world, computer vision in particular, uh, that claim that they can tell whether you're a criminal or, tell, you know, or, or be able to infer your sexual orientation by just looking at facial images and using you know, fancy um, computer vision. But in this particular article that was posted on the archive in 2016, this really, when I first saw it, it really harkened back to Cesar Lombroso's work, who was sort of the, crimi the father of criminality at the time. In, in 1876, you know, at that time, he was sort of more towards the end of his career. He had done some work in criminology, and he said, you know what? I can tell, someone, I can tell whether someone's a criminal by looking at their morphological features. Um, and... You know, nowadays we look at that and say that's silly, but at the time it, it was it stirred a lot of conversation. It eventually was debunked about 30 years after that as pseudoscience because of the racial undertones, of course, and, and also the ridiculousness of it. But it's come back in the computer science world. This paper, what they had done is they had taken photos of criminals, um, and these were convicted criminals, not necessarily guilty individuals, but they were convicted criminals. They had um, they had their mug shots that they had access to, and then they went to uh, professional job sites, kind of like a LinkedIn. They don't have that in China, but they have these LinkedIn photographs that they, um, they had as their training data. And you'll notice here that I'll do nothing with the black box algorithm. So when I explain these kind of results to the public, I can say, all right, um, I'm not gonna, uh, we're not going to talk about how the algorithm was imp implemented because most of the time when I review papers, I review uh, hundreds of papers a year for journals and conferences, and it's very rare is the black box have I found the black box the core reason why something is wrong? 
But they sort of claim here, I put it in big, so you can't even hardly read it because it's so bullsh bullshit, I'll say, uh, that unlike a human examiner, a computer vision basically has no subjective baggage or biases. And I see this in more and more papers all the time. And we can teach the public, again, you don't have to be a computer scientist and you should know that that is, that's absolutely bullshit. A lot of these algorithms not only have as much bias as humans, they have more. So I'll just kind of cut to the che or cut to the conclusion of this particular paper. Their main conclusion was that if you looked at theta and rho, there was this important angle, this distance between your nose and the corners of your mouth, and, and this uh, sort of angle here at those two points that revealed most of what was going on. And as you know, Dan's smiling there. He, I think he knows what's going on. What's going on, Dan? Smile, Smile detector. And actually, at the time. If, or actually, if they would have invented this maybe a decade or so ago, that would have been great. But we have this technology. It wasn't that great of an, uh, an invention. Um, but it, you know, they basically came up with a smile detector, and not necessarily a detector that could detect cr criminals or not. They do have, they did produce their criminal subtypes uh, and non-criminal um, subtypes. And just by looking at it, you can start to call BS. So the goal of this class, again, is to take this kind of example not focus as much on the algorithms itself, but uh, focus on the data and the interpretation of that data. Now, of course, this, this, there's many, many other examples. We, we note some of them on the website. We'll note others as we, as we respond to them. But this, this, this one paper that came out of Stanford, actually, claiming that they could um, guess whether you, you know, basically predict your um, sexual orientation by looking at facial photographs had a similar flair to it. But in that case, it was in the interpretation that Carl and I think that they were wrong. But really, I think what a lot of the world of academia is starting to feel, one of my, friend, my colleagues at, at Harvard in public health, he sent me this definition after his frustrations with big data. The idea that if you, if you throw enough, you know, a large enough pile of horseshit, you'll, you'll probability contain some sort of pony in that, in that horse manure. So let me just give you a couple examples of how we teach students, sort of pet peeves that I have in reviewing papers and mistakes that I see all the time. And then I'm going to get to sort of more of the kind of mi the sort of misinformation side of and the sort of uh, sort of science and society kind of uh, aspects of the talk. So one big pet peeve that I have is the ways in which any time a histogram is shown, we sort of manipulate these bin sizes all the time. And even in great places like the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, these are good journalistic um, uh, sort of venues for talking about data. They, um, they claim here in this particular paper that the middle class is who we should be um, taxing. And in that case, you could zoom in and you can start to see some of this fishiness where it starts as, you know, you know, bins of five, then it goes bins of 30, then it goes bins of 100, then 10. You know, arbitrarily, these bins are chosen and then you make a case about which um, class you should be taxing. When in fact, <laughs> like this was done by Ken Schultz, you can actually, if you're going to allow me to do that, then you could make a case, you could write a story in the Wall Street Journal, journal that has three conclusions. One would be taxing the poor, one would be taxing the middle class, and one would be taxing the wealthy, just by slight variations in the bin size. And so by doing this, we hope to teach students that this is, you know, if you watch out for this, um, you can sort of put your red flags down when you see these manipulations. And what we do actually, we do exercises where we give them the same data and we say, tell us this particular story. And then we have another group in class tell us a very different story. And they start to see, wow, there's easy ways to manipulate data. Now, even, of course, in the tech world, sometimes there's these big conferences you guys know of. Um, sometimes you show these cumulative plots of you know, iPhone growth sales. And as far as I know, all cumulative plots go up. They never go down. So really, another way to show that, maybe not as, not as attractive, is to maybe just show quarterly sales, which of course, again, tells a different story depending on what story you want to tell. Now this was published recently in Statista that was looking at basically the leveling off of carbon dioxide levels. Now that you know seemed a little strange when we first looked at this, but again, like the bin size, you start to see sort of strange things. You guys can't see it from here, but I'll basically say it has these 30-year jumps, and then it jumps in one-year increments at the end, 2011, 2012, 2030. And Statista, by the way, it doesn't have any sort of left or right leaning like some of these other sites. So if you take that exact same data, the story, of course, changes if you have even been even tick sizes. Um, that's the exact same data. It's the annual CO2 emissions if you do that with even. But it's this kind of manipulation in this world where data graphics and statistics and, of course, you know, all kinds of data presentation are now used as arguments 
and used as a way of communicating that we're sort of after for this class. Now, they can be really egregious, like this particular example that was uh, a graphic showing the um, effects of the of Florida Stand Your Ground law. In 2005, they, they invoked this very controversial law about standing your ground and allowing you, if you wanted to shoot someone, if you felt threatened. And you can see here how the black line drops down. But there's something strange going on with this particular graph. Does anyone see? You guys, it's hard to see way back there. But the origin is on the top rather than the bottom. And over, oh, about the last 2,000 years, we usually put the origin at the, at the, at the corner. So it's, you know, it's these small manipulations, but these things go on Twitter, they go on Facebook, and then they get shared, and you wouldn't imagine. When we find a lot of these examples, these are not things that have been tweeted once or twice, or retweeted. These are things that are tweeted in the wrong way tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of times. And it's, so it's these things that we want the, the public to get really good at looking at. Now, there's other, other sort of data problems all the time. You know, uh, you know, Edward Tufte talks a lot about these things called ducks. We love finding ducks. We have our students find ducks. This is, uh, as uh, Venturi says, we have a right to decorate construction, but never to construct decoration. And we see this in data graphics all the time. Like you see, you, you can't even tell what that is hardly. But you know, how many glasses of water do you? Well, you see, you see this all the time with this sort of mesh of art, uh, artists, which I know they're trying to do the best thing, but many times the stories are are not only wrong, are sort of being conveyed wrong by how they're showing their graphics, many times they're sometimes the opposite of what they're trying to tell. So we teach the students how to look for these ducks. We teach students how to look for what we call glass slippers. That's when you take data and throw them in a graphic that has nothing to do with the way that the data is being presented. Here's one that just came out yesterday. Uh, yeah, yesterday. Um, so a couple of, uh, a group of scholars in Spain have been looking at uh, all the different metrics that we use in science to measure success. So they put it in a periodic table. But what does that, what is the, what is a periodic, there was a real, there's a real set of um, specific um, reasons why the periodic table was built as it was, and it has nothing to do with just layering a bunch of sort of arbitrary metrics um, in science. So we see these glass slippers all the time as well. And then there's this, this, this principle that we talk about in our class, we call it the principle of proportional link, and that is when you show data, it has to be pro pro proportional to the amount of pixels you devote to a screen. So if you devote, you know, a if you're comparing 150, there should be 50% of this amount of pixels devoted uh, for the same amount as the, the, the 100 value. So let me show you what I mean. So this was a, a, a paper written out of, I think, OEC, or I can't remember where it was written out of, but Basically, it was showing the difference between the number of hours that Germans work at 40.4 versus those lazy French at the bottom at 37.4. But this is the, uh, like, there's so many. I, I find the, this example almost every single day, um, either in the literature, in the scientific literature, or in, of course, newspapers. In this case, the, this principle of proportional link is violated tremendously because it zooms in all the way to 36, and you can't, that's if you compare actually the, the bottom bar graph to the top one in proportional to their actual differences, it's, it's vastly off. And if you rescale that with zero, then you see, again, a much different story. Now, this kind of, I could give, I could go example after example. Here's one uh, where we actually measured the number of pixels because we just wanted to see how different it was. The case being made here is that High-income Americans pay the majority of federal taxes. They show the bottom here. The top 1% pays 39.5%. But if you actually measured the number of pixels devoted to this argument, there's 125 times as many pixels per percentage point. And if you look at the volume, as implied by volume, it's 2,600 times what the actual difference is. And yet we do these things all the time. And you know, maybe this is an honest mistake. And actually, this one, if you sliced down like a, ver a vertical line or you did it along one of those edges, maybe it would be more accurate, but this idea of in invoking volume. So this sort of stuff happens all the time. And of course, according to the National Review, this is the only, only chart you ever need to see. What do we have to worry about with climate change? Look, if you zoom out, you see that there's no change. And of course, this is where the principle of proportional link doesn't apply because we're in line graph world now. And in that case, zooming in and looking at this two degree difference over the last half a century, does make a difference for those that study environmental sciences. This is, this is something to at least take notice of. But when we see these, another thing we do with students is we teach them how to refute. 
the class is about calling bullshit, not just spotting bullshit. So one of the things that uh, what we devote a lot of our time to is how do you refute BS? So in this case, how would you refute this? Well, one of the things you can do um, is, a, is a technique. Well, there's lots of techniques, which I'll talk about um, this sort of uh, uh, reductio ad absurdum. And there's various other things I can just show just to give you an example of these refutation strategies. But for students, we say do this sort of thing. So Bloomberg said, if you buy this graph, then what I'll do is I'll put time on the x-axis and time on the y-axis, and I'll zoom out far enough and prove to you that time doesn't march forward. And so this can be highly effective for teaching students um, the sort of ridiculousness of certain kinds of data arguments. And it's this that we sort of need, I think, when we talk about myths for sort of attacking these myths. And so this is sort of what we're doing in our class. We're sort of doing this. Now, graphics have, be you know, in the olden days, we had, you know, very simple sort of pie graphs and um, geography sort of based kind of graphs for our newspapers. And in 2018, um, we've gotten very sophisticated. In fact, this was a graph I found right before the, when we were in D.C., and I'll show it again, how sophisticated our graphs have gotten. MSNBC was reporting on the Mueller investigation tweets, and they, they tweeted, uh, they, they reported this on MSNBC. Trump tweets out mentioning Mueller by name. You have zero, one, two, three, and then you have this, this, this something that looks like explosion up to three, two. You know, of course, I make fun of both media, left and right. It's not, it's not hard to do. It's just, it's everywhere. But I mean, this is the sort of sophistication of visualization experts we have now pushing out the news. <laughs> and so this is something we sort of have students watch out for as well. But in, in reality, many of our newspapers, and actually New York Times makes mistakes too, but the problem is in the sophistication, and I'm all for these new interactive data um, tools that allow the user to examine the data in many different ways, but as something my, my, my colleagues Jessica Holman and, and Jeff Hare have talked about, we can also get a multiple comparisons problem in the same ways that we can with statistics. So this is, in statistics, we're always worried about p-hacking and sort of keep looking for something until you finally get that, the p-value that, that you, you need for that arbitrary cutoff. Well, you can do the same with graphic, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, exploratory data analysis, EDA. And so we're concerned about that, and we see this becoming more and more of a problem. All right, so let me just talk about a couple of refutation things, and then I'm going to move, shift gears to sort of the fake news and misinformation stuff. So there are many ways to refute. I, know, I noted the one sort of thing. I'll give you another example. Nature and some of our best publications are not immune to these problems. So this, this particular study was published in Nature, and they wanted to see, um, the authors were, were making a claim that females who were in red and men who were in blue, they were both dropping in their 100-meter their sprint times. And according to the model, as you can see in the headline, women sprinters are closing the gap on men and may one day overtake them. But there was a problem with this that was noted by a high school class in Texas. And actually, this other, uh, this is also a reductio ad absurdum. She showed the arguments, methods, or assumptions lead to ridiculous conclusions. In this, Kenneth Wright writes, Sir, A.J. Tatum and colleagues calculate that women may outsprint men by the middle of the 20th second century. They omit to mention, however, that a far more interesting race should occur in about 2636, when times of less than zero seconds will be recorded. And I love this end part. This is where we can have so much fun with students and data responses in good, and do this in good nature. The authors may wish to address the obvious challenges raised by both timekeeping and teaching of basic statistics. So it's these kinds of things. We try to make this a fun kind of class because we see that, um, you know, in this world that's sort of hyperpolarized, we need to sort of have some fun and also be able to call BS on ourselves. I students call BS on me all the time, which is a lot of fun. And the other thing, of course, you know, there's lots of these examples. I could go through many, many, be memorable, use analogies like I'll show you this one. The analogy turns out to be highly effective, but very difficult for the students. We found that having them create analogies is a real, for these kinds of examples, is really difficult. So in Seattle right now, we've got this really big debate going on whether the $74 million we spent on our taxes really helped what was the Mercer mess. So Amazon came in, they bought all this land, and now it's just almost a standstill in traffic down at South Lake Union. So Como News, which is our local news station, they wrote this headline saying, $74 million later, Mercer mess is only two seconds faster. And this really ignited the conversation. I mean, you should see the, you know, you go to the comments after the news, whoa, this really lit things up. The problem, and they really, and they write this, they say, you know, went from seven minutes, 48 seconds, 
to, you know, from 70 minutes and 50 seconds to 7 minutes and 48 seconds, an improvement of 2 seconds. But the problem is, when, when I sort of, when Carl and I have looked at this, in, in a congested city, if you improve one area of the city and it becomes a more, and, and the traffic moves better, people are going to move there. And maybe at equilibrium, we have sort of the same time. And they even wrote this in the story. This Mercer corridor now handles 30,000 more co cars a day and still saves two seconds. So really, you're saving like 10 million trips a year and not causing any more extra time. So really, the headline could have been, Seattle Road Improvements Project allows 10 million extra trips per year with no increase in travel time. So we try to teach students how to write alternative headlines. And in and, and, and doing that, they start to realize, wow, there's lots of different ways in which you tell a story again with these. But here's the analogy on this one. So I don't know a lot about baseball. My six-year-old's really into baseball right now, so I'm learning more about it. And that would be like if you buy this, the original argument, because there's a silly metric that's being used to evaluate whether the $74 million was useful, you could use this metric. Meritor's hitting declines in 2010 despite $78 million investment in Felix Hernandez. And, and I, like I said, I don't know a lot about baseball, but I do know that hitting and defense are some pretty unrelated in this particular sport. So the idea is that silly metrics are always used in the news to do sort of like top most dangerous cities or whatever, and yet they compare cities that have different boundaries of the urban area and the suburbia area or whatever. And in academics, we do this all the time. We have these rankings of university, and they kind of do this sort of thing when they do these rankings. I saw the sign of um, the kinds of ways in which we do rankings. So it makes, you know, some of these metrics just make no sense, and we want our students to be out looking for these silly, silly ways of, of doing metrics. All right, so we have a whole bunch of like um, tips for spotting BS, and I'm just gonna just do one quick one and get over to the what I, I was gonna show. You know, if a claim sounds too good to be true, like this was tweeted out that 40% down in scholarship or, or in admissions to universities after about a week and a half into the debate around the immigration, and again, that I had my own contentions and, and my own arguments against that particular immigration policy, but down 40%. That doesn't make a lot of sense in two weeks. So if you look to the actual article, you find it's not down nearly 40% at schools. You find that it was down at 40, or, so it wasn't down 40%, my apologies. It was down at 40% of the schools. And again, teaching students to dig a little bit further. And actually, if you dig to the report on this, it wasn't just that they were down at 40% of the schools rather than down 40%. It was that they were up at 35% of them and up at 40%. Yet this thing, this tweet, like some of these that we pick out are some that are, you know, they, they really go viral. And, and the virality in this didn't, even though there were people in the comments hidden way down in the, in the retweets and the responses, no one picked up on the fact that it was not down at 40%. It was a much different story. Also, we have to sort of watch out for our own confirmation bias. We teach students about confirmation bias, and that's sort of one of those human crutches that we have, these cognitive crutches that we have. And even I even say to my students, I fall for it too, so I study the role of gender in science, and, and as you could expect, you know, we're making improvements, but we have a lot to go still in trying to improve gender equity. And there was this was tweeted out saying, you know what, look at, look at the difference in uh, recommendation letters for female and, and women, and this sort of spread like wildfire. But the problem is um, that what was being shown by my, the, my friend at the time was that, uh, so basically, so sorry to, to sort of back up, you see here that uh, the female um, words are sort of like grindstone words, like male words are sort of fabulous, remarkable, talented, brilliant, magnificent, and really what was going on, and people were spreading, because in many ways it confirmed with my own biases that I did think there was large differences, but the problem is, I didn't show it here, that my friend tweeted the hypothesis. It wasn't the results of the paper. In fact, if you go to the paper, the results of these two letters were similar. Now, there's many studies that have shown just the opposite result, but in this case, it was the hypothesis being spread around, and I even see this, where the hypothesis gets spread around and people say, see, look, the differences, and that's not even the result. So anyway, it's devoid confirmation bias. We do a bunch of thinking in orders of magnitude. I'll skip this so I can jump to this other aspects of the talk. But we teach the students how to do Fermi estimation. Fermi estimation is where you think in orders of magnitude behind the napkin. I know you probably do these interviews at Google all the time. Um, 
So we do sort of things like there was this story about ending the food stamp program on Fox News. And, you know, we say, well, let's just try to quickly estimate if $70 million is, you know, it sounds like a lot of money. It's we should, maybe if it's if it's this much money, we should can the program. But really, we want to know what that amount of money is in the context of the full program. So we ask what fraction of Americans receive food stamps. Actually, how many do you think? I'm curious. Ten. Yeah, definitely not 100 percent. So you can do this quickly. Yes, it's ten. How much do you think the average food stamp recipient receives annually? How much? Yeah, you guys are good. It's so many of my students say ten thousand, and I'm like, they must shop at Whole Foods or something. This is this is like expensive. Yeah, it's about a thousand. We know there's about 300 million people, so we do this quick calculation, and it's 0.2 percent of the expenditures. You can do this right in the back of your head right when you read this story, and you can already tell that that would be a darn good number. We work in the world, Starbucks is home in Seattle, and we have you know, Nordstrom and Costco and all these big um, retail companies, and they would love to have a point two expenditure. Now, the funny part is that the agriculture department was upset about this report. It turns out the number was completely made up. And the number was, act agriculture says, actually, you know what? It wasn't 70 million, it's 300 million, and we're still proud of it. So the lesson here I tell students is if you're going to make up a number, make up a really, really big up number. Don't make up just 70 million. And it wasn't Fox who actually made it up. They actually they did admit it. They admitted that it was wrong, but then they jumped on it and said, well, it's 300 million, see? Um, so, but it was that they actually picked the number from somewhere else, which as you track it back, it was a totally made up number. So, um, you know, common statistical traps. I will say this. I mean, of all the things that we teach the students is like things like selection bias. So my favorite... Um, Selection bias app examples. If if you were to create an app that identifies mushrooms, you would have an amazing survival bias. You'd amazing survival bias on your apps. You have great reviews because those that survived your app would probably do really well. You know, and actually we study uh, a lot of internet behavior um, with different services. And when we use Facebook, just to give you a different an idea of how much different Facebook users are and their behavior than Google, I was playing around based on uh, some uh, another colleague doing this. And if you search, like if my wife searched, my husband is, she might see my, my, my husband's of my best friend, my life, awesome, my everything. I bet you can imagine how different this changes if you do this exact same search on Google. This is what shows up on Google. My husband's mean, addicted to porn, depressed, selfish, the best, missing, lazy. So there's this sort of selection bias in how, if we're, if we're, not, if we're not careful on what the sort of, uh, the sort of, people that were studying these um, in, our, in our research, we, we sort of have to remind ourselves in our research, you know, are we having these kinds of selection bias problems? So I'm going to skip the data censoring example because I'm going to move on to the ending here. So the most important principle in this class that we talk about and why people should care is that it sort of goes to this uh, a bullshit asymmetry principle by Brandolini, who's a software programmer in Italy. I think he really sort of wrapped it up pretty well. He said the amount of energy necessary to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. And I think for this reason, it's really easy to create fake news. We all know that. It's hard to clean up. I mean, one of the things in, in, health, in the healthcare industry that I get really concerned about are things like the, the Wakefield paper that was published in 1998, perpeting a link between M, uh, the MMR vaccine and autism. And of all things in healthcare, we have spent millions and millions of dollars refuting that and still we're seeing rates drop on vaccine usage in the United States and we're seeing these outbreaks due to something that was completely fabricated and, and, and false and has been is refuted more than almost anything ever in medical research likely and yet it, it hangs around and of course we see this even with Pizzagate you know even when Alex Jones at Infowars said okay I admit it was wrong he was gonna get sued by the way um, so he admitted it was wrong, he was promulgating it. Even after that, there were families still um, on the White House lawn last year protesting that it's an even bigger conspiracy. Um, so these things hang around, and it's, but it's easy to create it. So really, uh, Dan asked me, he said, you know, what, uh, um, you know, well, first of all, I was just going to say too, and there's now more evidence. There's a science, uh, cover of science uh, a month or so ago um, of a, a research project looking at how falsehoods spread versus true, true hoods. So if you look at false rumors versus true rumors, false rumors tend to move faster. They're sort of, they're built that way. They're engineered that way. So there, I mean, there's a little bit of a selection bias probably there, but they've sort of take, they've accounted for these things, 
I imagine. So these are the things we're sort of after. We know there's propaganda. That will always be there. It always has been there. It always will be. And it is probably at a different scale than we've ever seen before um, in today's world. So we do need to contend with that. We'll always contend with that. Um, and really, the, the problem nowadays, because it's at a big scale, this disinformation versus misinformation, this disinformation, this idea where you just sort of throw, uh, you know, sort of uncertainty and sort of distrust about your institutions, as, as Gary Gasparov says, it's just there to annihilate truth and trust in our democratic institutions. We do need to take notice, and, and research, in the research community in which I live, it can't be just that. It needs to be Google. That's why when Dan, won, uh, I've talked to Dan about this, we sort of need to figure out ways to, to, to work together, hopefully. So he asked me, sort of, how can Google help from my perspective? And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you a few things that are that are a lot of the conversations at these conferences around these issues, whether it's at journalism conferences or conferences um, in computational social science. These are the things that sort of we're talking about as community, and I'm sort of communicating. So don't, you know, don't take too much offense because it's a hard thing to build search engines and all the tools that you guys are building. So I'll just go through a couple of the things that we say. So first of all, we need to, I mean, you of all places, can you, you guys are in a position where you can help the spread of misinformation in general. Actually, I recently talked to, um, uh, at a dental school conference, it was pretty cool because they appreciated the joke that we have some major truth decay going on right now in the, uh, on the internet. But this is a real thing that they're scared about. So this was also, this is also being promulgated, if you look here on the bottom right, you can't maybe see it, it's InfoWars. They're pushing this idea that fluoride in our water is, 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 is really poison that we're putting in, not taking into account all the studies. Again, this has been there's been tons and tons of money and investment and long studies investing this that are going to affect, likely, kids' health down the line, yet this stuff is spreading. So helping us, you know, of course, just slowing the spread of this. I, I mean, I have my own solutions, but I'm curious to see, um, you know, maybe what Google's thinking about. The other thing is stopping some of these new technologies. Some of you may have seen this actually came out of, this technology came out of one of the labs at the University of Washington, actually Adobe Research, this idea that you can now not only Photoshop images, you can take voice and make it almost exactly the same. This was the famous video um, where they made Obama say things he never really said, but it sounds exactly like him. The visual isn't perfect, but the voice is spot on. So now what are we going to do when people can actually, you know, they can, they can make someone say something or sound like it if they were on the, as if they were on the radio or, you know, eventually on video. We need to figure out how to combat some of this new technology that's going to really, that really is uh, scary to me. It sort of keeps me up at night. For sure. The other thing is that all these questionable news sites that you know still show up high in the rankings. If you use your engine, um, you guys know you know all these little tricks that people do, like abc.co.com or sort of .com.co. Um, these 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 questionable websites. I'm amazed that they keep showing up in high in high ranking results. So trying to figure out how to you know I mean. That, I don't know, and someone's in charge of the, the ranking. But there's so many of these. We can, like, people that are studying this, we have tons and tons of highly questionable sites that are putting out garbage all the time and figuring out how to downweight their results um, would, you know, but I know there needs to be this independence uh, from the algorithm. So I'm just, just saying that there is a lot of stuff that keeps getting a lot of, um, the fake, you know, fake news is doing a good job. There's lots and lots of examples out there. You guys know of these, I'm sure, that's fooling the search engine. There's, I mean, just even this, these, some of these screen captures. I mean, we have tons and tons of examples. This after the election. Final election number shows up if you would have searched final vote count 2016. It showed just completely fabricated numbers that was, that was if you root it all the way back, it was back to a tweet from a guy who um, obviously is known to sort of put out fake things. So these are things that, uh, you know, of course, um, on a really practical standpoint that Google can do. The other thing is, I mean, here's another example of it totally being uh, tricked. And actually, this guy named Paul Horner, who's known to create a lot of this fake news, has made a lot of money. He just thinks people are just dumber. But I don't think that's the case. I think a part of it is our interfaces and our, and our access to these tools and the data that we're um, sort of engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis that are, you know, they're not making us dumber, but they're, they're certainly making it harder to distinguish true news from some bad news. The other thing is, like, Search engines gobble up everything that's out there. And if I want to make a fake site before I leave Google today, I can do it. I can create a fake site, and I, I, know all the, like, I know all the strategy just like many of you do. We can create all sorts of ways of boosting um, crazy 
crazy things. And like this one was done by, this was uh, um, Paul Dun Dungy, who, who basically said, if I was to ask, is Obama planning a coup? Now there's no, no one's had time to even refute it at this time, but if you did that search, you're going to find lots of websites because all of the sort of fabricated kinds of um, stories that you come up are that's what's gobbled up and it takes time to refute. Let me give you an example. This is something that Carl and I, we're like, we're just, we're just saying, okay, let's do the most ridiculous possible story we can think of. We say, do vaccinations cause shaken baby syndrome? There can't possibly be something out there on this. We search and what do you know? When is shaken baby syndrome possibly vaccine injury instead? So all these things do exist. I mean, in this case, this, this ridiculous question that we ask, it does exist. And the health and like the medical field doesn't have time to refute something like this. They're trying to do things much more important because this is so ridiculous. But yet what, our, what the world knows, sort of Google, there's truthness that comes along. There's sort of, in, 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 in sort of intrinsic or, or sort of, um, sort of, hidden truthness that sort of hides along um, anything that sort of arrives as search results. And so I don't know, something, I mean, you know, you, and I know you guys are thinking about this. I'm just saying these are the things that we're concerned about. The problem also is that the world in which we live, the unvarnished truth just simply isn't good enough anymore in a click-driven world. So when you have, you know, these other links that promise these, these experiences um, and these sort of crazy you know, uh, sort of headlines that sort of grab us and then the sort of payment that these individuals get, these economic incentives this, that like the Macedonian teenagers received for coming up with things that people clicked on, sort of the, it's the economic incentives that I think we can attack. I don't, we'll never be able to fully stop propaganda, but maybe there's something we can do. I'm just curious if what you guys are thinking about in terms of so at least nullifying some of the, or maybe never, maybe it's not possible given the, uh, but I'd just love to just have discussions about this, the economic incentives for creating fake news and, and sort of in this click-driven world, both in journalism. Of course, you guys maybe saw this, and maybe actually, and there's been several research um, uh, sort of discussions about this, about how YouTube, well, first of all, YouTube's algorithm, of course, is different than your, your search engine, but how even in co incognito mode, the YouTube is pushing you so quickly to these conspiracy-laden, myth-driven videos that even if you wanted to stay away from them, you couldn't. And I just did this the other day. My son really likes the International Space Station YouTube channel. So I went to the YouTube channel, the live station. I did it in incognito mode. I didn't want it to know anything about me. So I went there. This is the NASA live shot from the International Space Station. And what do you think showed up of the 10 or so recommendations on the right? Any, any ideas? Two of the 10, I think, were flat earths. Here they are, right here. This is incognito, my very first search. I go straight to the space station. 10 things you didn't know about the Earth, and then flat Earth, and, and all, all these conspiracy videos, it just, it seems like we can do better um, than, than, than conspiracy videos as the first thing that like maybe my son saw. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I think we can go after. The other issue is the Cambridge Analytica thing really concerns me as a researcher because it did involve a researcher that gave his data away. And I think that likely will create some reticence among Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Amazon who, who will all have been sharing data with researchers. And so I'll encourage you from this small room with a small number of people to keep sharing data with researchers because I think we can help. Um, we, uh, I think we, our, our incentives should be in line and, and we're not always as uncareful as that particular researcher at uh, Cambridge. Also, we have these fake news data challenges. There's lots of challenges that academics are really interested in, and students are interested in participating in. Google has the data and, and other big organizations like it. And doing some more of these data challenges would be a way to engage with the community. And we have some ideas on data that you may have that could help us try to go after misinformation. Um, we're also in our lab in, uh, working with the public um, station uh, in, in Seattle trying to build public service announcement video series and if you could I mean there might be ways in which you can help s you know send out some of these PSAs I mean you would have to get your okay on it we have we're not the only one there's several other groups that are making these public service announcements videos about fake news and trying to get sort of some education into the public through fun animated videos and then finding out ways that we could work with Google 
um, around that. That would be cool. You know, supporting our fact-checking organizations. They don't. They, it's I, I've, I'm working with Snows, for example, and other groups, and I've talked to many of the other fact-checking organizations. They're doing such a service, but they have such little money. Um, so I'll just and I, you know, I don't I don't have any sort of personal investment. I just think they do such an important role for us. Um, I mean, just think at Snopes, for example. They they get you know it's it's not nothing compared to Google, but they get about 20 million visits a month, and yet they have like 12 or 13 employees. I mean, it's amazing the service they're providing. So figuring out how to help them. So I'll end here by saying that you know there has been a lot of worry about this sort of misinformation epidemic, and I am definitely worried, and I think we. Uh, you know, society needs to attack it, but we've been through it before. This is one of my favorite quotes from Filippo de Strada in 1474. He said that he was talking about the printing press at the time. He goes, writing indeed, which brings in gold for us, should be respected and held to be nobler than all goods, unless she has suffered degradation in the brothel of the printing press. <laughs> so here's the thing. I don't want to take away our search engines. I, 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 use our search, I use our search engines every day. I love, I, I mean, as much as I'm annoyed by social media, some of the problems, I still wouldn't take social media away. I wouldn't, I, I think what we have is a great tool, just like the printing press is. We just need to sort of work through it. But we do have some serious things to contend with. And it's news stories like this. So this was a news story. It was fake. It was completely refuted. It's taken down. If you go there now, you get a 404. But it says that it was claiming that Israel was threatening Pakistan with, with nuclear weapons. And you think, oh, that's so ridiculous. I, throw, I show my students and they say, oh, that's ridiculous. No one would believe that. Well, the defense minister of Pakistan thought it was a real news story and tweeted out, Israel forgets Pakistan is a nuclear state too. So it's not, you know, as much as I do say we've been through this before, we, we can get through it. There is sort of an existential threat here when leaders... And when big, sort of big, sort of big issues like the use of, of weapons in response to fake news. So I think we need to take it serious. Our, our approach is to attack it with new, our education. That's what my sort of mission is over the next several years, is to do what I can to teach students in high school, in universities, and the general public how to become better consumers of information, specifically around data. And others are doing digital. We do media literacy, too. That's sort of one area. But my main sort of my biggest contribution hopefully is through sort of data, uh, the, the uh, misinformation that comes in, 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 the, in the form of data. And so sort of attacking with education, that's what we're doing right now and, and happy to talk anytime. There's lots of others. We have 50, over 50 hours of lectures. You can go hang around. And if you have ideas and examples, I love examples. So if you have other examples, happy to talk. You can follow us on Twitter um, and you can contact me anytime and that's our URL. So with that, I'll stop and then we can have some discussion. So there we go. So how should we do that now that we have people all, uh, online? Um, yeah. You can talk to them. Yeah. And th thanks for hanging out. I know you guys had lunch. You probably had other things to do. So thanks for joining. If you have any comments or questions or your own sort of thoughts about this, I, that's yeah. why I'm here. So. Um